Georgetown has a rich heritage, which most people recognize by its well-preserved and thriving downtown square and lovely Old Town historic homes. However, the story of the evolution of health care in Georgetown, from a small town hospital to cutting-edge medical facility, is inextricably linked to the development and success of the city. This documentary highlights that evolution, as well as the cast of characters who brought it into being. For 70 years, after Georgetown's founding in 1848, until the first hospital opened on January 1st, 1918, Georgetown's numerous county doctors used their own offices or patients' homes to provide whatever medical care or surgery was required. Most small rural towns at that time simply did without hospitals. On New Year's Day in 1918, the Williamson County Sun reports a stream of visitors flocked to the opening of the new King's Daughter Sanitarium, a renovated house on Ash Street. The visitors were delighted and surprised to realize that Georgetown had at last a hospital. Not a makeshift one, but an up-to-date, well-equipped hospital. While the advocacy efforts of the Sun and the Young Men's Business League prepared the way, the credit for this enterprise wholly belongs to the local women of the King's Daughters chapter. These women, led by Mrs. J.M. Daniel, raised $3,500 to purchase and renovate the house, which had four private rooms, three hospital wards, an operating room, sterilizing room, and nurses' quarters. The hospital was quickly used for Southwestern students who caught the Spanish flu in 1918 and served the community for more than five years. With Georgetown's population at 3,000 by 1923, Dr. S.S. Martin and Sons, Walter and John, also doctors, felt it was time for Georgetown to have a larger and more complete facility. The Martin Hospital, erected at 605 East University, boasted 14 rooms, diet kitchen, x-ray, laboratory, operating and sterilizing room, and the most modern equipment known to science. After operating the Martin Hospital for 24 years, in 1947, the family sold it to doctors H.R. Gaddy, Alan Barr, and J. Frank Clark, who changed the name to Georgetown Hospital. Within a few years, both Clark and Barr had moved from Georgetown, and Dr. Gaddy remained the only physician until Dr. Doug Benold opened his medical practice in 1950. This is where our story begins. One night, Connie called and said, come fast. And I came and that train was right across University Avenue. So I just parked my car and it had stopped. And I just went right in between those cars <laughs> and ran up to the hospital. It wasn't but about two blocks and got there just about in time to deliver that baby. I 
I was a family practice doctor in a small town. I was born in Temple, Texas, in King's Daughters Hospital. We were a happy family, and I graduated from Lampasas High School in 1940. I graduated from college, Southwestern University, and I got a, I got a BS in chemistry. I went to University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas and I graduated from there whenever the war broke out, I don't recall. Well, it didn't change that much for me. When I started out, I knew that I wanted to go into the service and we were, we were bait for drafting and uh, so they uh, took me in and continued my education as an MD. And I went in the Navy and served till the war broke out. My family all lived there and that's why I came back. Doug grew up here. He was the quarterback for the Georgetown Eagles and they won every game and he just loved Georgetown. And he told me early on that he wanted to practice in a town like Georgetown before we ever even got married. You know that we couldn't find a town like Georgetown. Finally, he said, you know, I think we need to practice where we want to live, even though there were six doctors already here and only 5,000 people. He told me, he said, we may starve to death, but that's where I want to live. In 1950, I moved to Georgetown and my first office was in the back of a drugstore on the square. This was not uncommon in those days for doctors to have offices in drugstores. So we came and he opened his office down on the square where the winery is now. There was a little drugstore called the City Drug. And behind it was a little tiny room that was just full of junk and they offered that to him free of charge. It was pretty slow going to say the least. The price for an office visit was pretty cheap and he'd come home at noon and say, well, I saw four people today, you know. <laughs> He had begun to build a pretty good practice. I used the local hospital. Dr. Getty and Dr. Clark owned the hospital, which had formerly been the old Martin Hospital. There were three doctors Martin in the area. One was a dentist and two were physicians, and they built that hospital. They had bought that hospital in 1947 and had refurbished it and had their offices in that hospital. I was given hospital privileges even though my office was downtown on the square. For two years, starting in 1950, I did a general practice and which included home deliveries and house calls all the way to Florence and Leander and all of that general area. When I had patients in the hospital that required surgery, I would usually had uh, Hal Gaddy either give the anesthetic for me or assist me in surgery. And we had a nurse anesthetist, Irene Swoush, who would give the anesthetics if both of us had to scrub. That was the situation and everything worked out fine except that in 1952, after two years of practice, I got called to active duty and was sent to Korea in the Air Force as a surgeon in the air wing. And by the time he came back, nearly all the old doctors either had died or were retired or had left Georgetown, and there was just Hal. So that took up two years and then came back to Georgetown to the drugstore by that time, some of the Georgetown doctors were either getting old or were leaving town. Soon after I came back from Korea, Hal and I were just about the only active physicians in town. We worked together very well and always 
helped each other either with surgery or giving anesthetics. I got to where I wanted to get out of the drugstore and sort of enlarge my capabilities with x-ray and lab and so forth and thought about building my own clinic. But Hal and I worked together well and we started talking about the possibility of a partnership. So this went on for a couple of years and finally in 1957 we we did agree to become partners and that involved buying half interest in the local hospital and then we bought the lot just east of the old hospital on University Avenue and built the clinic in 57, 58. Became partners and opened that clinic that still stands there at that site. That was the start of a, a great partnership, I felt. After my second child was born, a nurse from the hospital came to see me. Her name was Golden Munson. And she came with another RN to my home in Theon, Texas, and begged me to come work night duty. I told her I'd try it. And when I went to work for Dr. Gaddy and Dr. Benol, they called me in one day and asked me if I'd be the chief nurse. And I accepted that position and became the head nurse at the hospital. It was a wonderful career. I cannot begin to tell you what a delight I had in working at Georgetown Hospital. And these girls, these ladies beside me, and the team of nurses at the hospital worked together in sync, and that's what made us successful. We worked as a team. I really liked working with the ladies and the families, with them getting their new babies and making sure they knew how to take care of them before they went home. So I decided I did not want to work in a huge, big hospital, and Georgetown was not very far from my house. So I went there, and I worked there a long time because I really loved that area, and that's where I worked, and we had many, many expansions there because it's a very small hospital when I first started working there. And so we just uh, worked in the OB department the whole time. You ran it for, you were in charge of the OB. You were in charge of this for quite a while. Yeah, And (laughs) how many babies were you delivering a year that, those first few years? Do you have any idea? (laughs) But by the time it expanded, weren't you up to like 500 babies a year or something like that? Yeah, there were quite a few, especially in the latter years. The first years, I think we probably delivered around about 400, 300, something like that. Because okay. we were really busy, and that's we started our expansions then. They received excellent care. Good nurses and good doctors. I think we all loved what we were doing, all of the yeah. nurses that were working in that area. So, and when you love what you're doing, you're going to be given good care. Hal and I worked there five years, just the two of us, taking call a week at a time to cover the emergency room and that sort of thing. Pretty soon, Doug and Hal were it. They would just work to death. And of course, he was desperate, and so it didn't take them long to get together. And they were as different as night and day in personality. But they got along great because each one tried to do more than his share of work. But they were desperate for another doctor because they'd take call one uh, week at a time. And at the end of that week, they were laid out. Well, Doug heard about this young doctor that was still in the Army in Germany from Woodville. And my, my hometown was a little town in East Texas right near Woodville. Well, Doug got busy and wrote to him in Germany, and his name was James Shepard. 
<laughs> greatest thing, one of the greatest things that ever happened to us. They hired him sight unseen, and he and Judy came. And uh, that made a great difference. We had three doctors then. Uh, we set about building the, the, the hospital and the clinic, and James Shepard was, Dr. James Shepard was heavily involved in this. You can imagine how happy we were in 1962 when uh, James Shepard joined us. Well, we decided before we got here, I think, that we, we wanted to, a small town, maybe a college town, close to a bigger town, and a small community. This Georgetown was only 5,000 at that time, and he was the third doctor. And when we started, they talked about having all this work for us, but really, you kind of built your own practice. <laughs> that, that, I just got the overflow, so I wasn't working that hard the first year or so. Of course, we took call a week, a week at a time, and that was called for everything, hospital, ER, babies. <laughs> but it was an ideal kind of practice for me. I, Doug had, had excellent uh, surgery training, at least a few years, more than most of us. With his uh, abilities and our interest to learn, we, we all scrubbed on every case, <laughs> even though we were busy in the office. We, we would uh, use the scrub together. And uh, the days did grow longer where you were seeing 40 patients a day maybe, but uh, it was a pleasure. It was uh, an old, broken down building. It, it didn't have a nurse's call system, so we set about to repair it. We uh, got a little done, and then we decided Dr. Bonneau got back from the war and James Shepard, and we decided that the best thing was for us to, to build the clinic, the new clinic, and the new wing on the hospital. When I came to Georgetown, there were 11 beds in the hospital, if my memory serves me correctly. And there were five rooms upstairs and six downstairs. The dynamics of a small hospital is just incredible. There was so much activity that if you worked in the emergency room, someone needed you on the west wing or someone needed you on the second floor or downstairs. It was a delightful time to practice medicine. Oh, uh, it was we didn't realize it at that time, but I certainly look back and know what a gift it was. Well, and the people got such good care. They were, you know, the doctors made rounds twice a day. And if you had 10 patients in the hospital, you had to make rounds, that's 20, visits, you know, a day. One lady told me once, she said, when Dr. Beno walks in the rooms and, and smiling, I feel better already, you know, just to have that attention. It was a whole different kind of world. And they felt responsible for their patients. Those days in medicine, you didn't make much money. <laughs> With a $3 office call and a $5 house call, the uh, babies like that came through the uh, clinic downtown, I think we got a hundred dollars for the, that's hospital and doctor and everything, uh, for delivery. The charges, they changed after Medicare came in and uh, I came in 62 and 65, uh, Medicare was started. The most significant thing in your and my lifetime, Medicare. Mm -hmm. And uh, since that time, the hospitals and everyone has flourished and uh, I think all due to Medicare and of course uh, our Central Texas fellow Mr. Johnson I think uh, got that passed. We were running short of nurses. There were a lot of 
A lot of women who had been nursing in the hospital for a long time, and they were getting older. And so we we realized we really needed uh, nurses. Now, so we came up with the idea of starting an LVN school, and it was um, it was kind of a fortunate. The band director at our Georgetown High School's wife was an RN who had worked as a teacher teaching nurses. So we contacted her and she was willing to serve. And uh, so we put out the notice of applications for, for an LVN school. And an LVN school was a one year course where you get classroom training and then work in the wards and the hospital. It was just a combination of book and actual experience. And at the end of that year, they'd take a, a state examination. Our girls, are, and then we started admitting boys, in, uh, a few boys in the class. They always had a tremendous success in the state exams. They were really commended by the state on how well they did. And that's that wasn't accidental. That was because we had some fine teachers. Ms. Kombach took over from Joyce Jackson, who was our first teacher, and ran that school for, I guess, 20 years before Austin Community College took, took it over for us. But we graduated a lot of nurses, and those nurses not only supplied our hospital, but supplied nursing homes and other hospitals in the vicinity. I bet we had probably two or three hundred. Our first class had uh, Caucasians, Latinos, and Blacks in the class, and uh, all of them graduated and did well on their on their board exams. Well, this was in six, 1960 when we actually formed a school and graduated the first class in 61. Uh, our schools were not integrated at that time, even though the Supreme Court had ruled eight years earlier that it was illegal to segregate. In fact, our, some of our school board members were running on the platform of we ain't integrated yet. And in those days, we had a ward for the blacks. They had like eight rooms uh, in the downstairs area, and that was for blacks. And no matter if you came in the hospital having a baby, a pneumonia, whatever, that's where you were put. And that was the times everybody accepted it. And that was in the early 60s. Yeah, I remember uh, the circus coming to town and hearing my parents talk about uh, Jim Crow. And I thought Jim Crow was a person. It's a Jim Crow, they was gonna, mm -hmm. at the, and uh, I had no idea, you know, that was terminology, you know, having to do with race, because I, I thought maybe Jim Crow was on the program. But what about most vivid memories about the uh, talking about race and, and uh, segregation? There was one, one theater here in town, the Palace Theater. And uh, all all the uh, blacks had to sit up in the balcony, and all the whites sat down on the floor. And um, there was this old man that was uh, uh, Leo Lackey. I never will forget his name. He was the he was the movie operator, and he was kind of also the security guard. He'd kind of walk around, and make sure none of us got too rowdy while we were watching the movie, or he'd kick us out. But um, 
I don't know where that came to mind, but it just did. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they won't talk about the movie with Cheryl. They didn't realize we had the best seats because we were up in the balcony. <laughs> and so, you know, we could just see the screen and everything. Those low, you know, they probably breaking their necks. Yeah. <laughs> but sitting, you know, low. But uh, I just thought I'd bring that in. <laughs> We didn't care just as long as we got in the movie. Yeah. It cost like a cents, 10 cents yeah. to go to the movie. 10 cents, 12 cents. It was 10, well, it's 10 when yeah. I'm a little old. Little, no, I'm going to say that. We decided that, that we ought to include uh, blacks and Latinos and Caucasians in our classes that we admitted to the school. And there were some some worrying at first about would our white patients accept black nurses. All in all, a really a success and mostly thanks to the efforts of Miss Kambach. She was just a great teacher. She had a ethic that she, she lined those girls up and this is the way it's done. Our school of nursing was integrated Mm -hmm. prior to the Georgetown Independent School District. Okay. Yeah. I didn't even realize that when we selected those students, I didn't give it a second thought. I didn't give it a second thought mm -hmm. that the schools weren't integrated and we just selected these wonderful LVN yeah. students. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I mentioned this last night, but one of those first graduate students went on to RN school and she was the, it is my understanding, I heard this by grapevine, but she was the head nurse of the public health department in Dallas County. She was one of our first black students, but I think there were about three. That school furnished nurses for nursing homes and hospitals all over the county for years. The Texas Medical Association had a placement service and I contacted that and I lined up about four or five interviews, and one was in Georgetown. So I had a few interviews in the Dallas area, and then it, we drove down here and um, met over James's house that night with uh, James and Judy and uh, Nell and Doug, and, and Hal and Peggy were there, and I didn't know it at this time, but, but we all sat around and had a wonderful evening. I said, yeah, I'm driving back tomorrow. And I said, what do you mean you're driving back tomorrow? He says, well, I'm attending a medical education conference in Dallas, and I just wanted to drive down and meet you and, and, and check you out, and I've got to go back to, and, to my class tomorrow. So Doug, uh, uh, Hal Gaddy drove all the way from Dallas to meet me that night over at James's house, and he drove back to finish his, his class. And I thought, wow. And it just was apparent from the time I met them that this was, these were the, the greatest men and, 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 and they're family oriented and, and they were practicing the type of medicine I wanted to practice. And so it was sort of a no brainer at that time. And I moved here and started practice in October of 69. And it was 20 wonderful years here. Uh, it was just a, a wonderful time in my life. And, uh, and once I started practice, I thought, I said, I, this, is, this is what I want to do. And I forgot about ever going back to do any kind of residency or further training. And it, it was just an excellent time in, in, my, my, in my lifetime. At that time, there were the four of us to start with. So Hal and I kind of backed each other up and you and James backed each other up. And, and um, so one would be on call. But if we had to do a surgery in the middle of the night, you'd call the second one out and and I, I I really truly had a wonderful experience with uh, with all of these great men that uh, it's, it's just a terrific experience it was a time when in the obstetrical world was a big fad for women to have their babies in the dark and in water it was a big thing mm -hmm. And Doug just, he would tell the ladies when they'd come in, it, it wasn't a huge demand, but it was particularly people from, it was a big hippie era, and the people from Austin started flocking over here to go to John Webb because he would do it 
And Doug would say, I've got to have, I've got to see what I'm doing. I can't be <laughs> delivering babies in the dark. And he'd send them to John Webb. Oh, that, oh gosh, that was fun. Shortly after I got here, and as, as the younger doctor, you tend to pick up younger, younger patients. The, you have to kind of put this in context of the times. I moved here in 69, so in the 70s, there was this cultural revolution in America. Oh, yeah. You know, of, 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 uh, the civil rights was going strong, uh, women's rights was going strong. You just really had a social upheaval. There was a young lady who came in and, and wanted and asked me specifically before she would be my patient. She said she was pregnant and she wanted to deliver according to the Laboye method. Well, interestingly enough, I had read about it. I had read in Newsweek, remember when there was print, sure. a print Newsweek? Uh, I had read an article about it in Newsweek and it was a French doctor who basically had a natural childbirth setting. And so I said, uh, yeah, I, I know a little bit about it and, uh, and I'd be interested. And I guess I discussed it with Hal. And he says, well, now, before you get too wild on this, he says, why don't you go visit with Mrs. Comback? So I went over to Mrs. Comback. I said, one of my patients wants to do a natural delivery, not be in the uh, delivery room, deliver in bed, in the room with her husband. Uh, attending and the lights would be dim low and the room would be nice and warm and uh, I said I'd be there and the nurse would be there and Miss Comback says yeah that that sounds all right if you're going to be there and the nurse is going to be there I don't see that that's any problem so <laughs> we started out with the first and then w once one happened they they came man they came from all over but um uh, we we delivered in the bed and I crawled up at the end of the bed and, and she propped up her legs and her husband helped hold up her legs and we delivered right there in the bed. This was before they had the beds that tear apart or anything else. And, and <laughs> part of the process is after the baby is born, you're supposed to then put the baby in warm water like it's going back into the womb. Uh, and everything. Well, we, we didn't know what to do, so we got one of those cans from down in the kitchen. Uh, you wanted that the, the Lord used to come in like a, a, fi a five gallon can, maybe, and fill it full of warm water, and we'd kind of duck the baby in there. And the, the babies didn't really like that much. They wanted <laughs> that was the best thing in the world. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So one of the nurses says, Well, why don't we use a bassinet? Remember those plastic yeah, bassinets yeah, for the, yeah. okay. So then we started putting, the, and, and then you could kind of stretch the babies out in the water. and They liked and, it. They liked it then. Yeah. And would let the husbands hold the babies. It was, it, it was a great experience, really. So we started doing that in Georgetown. Then some of the word spread around it's, uh, the Austin area, especially the University of Texas area. So we started teaching Lamas classes at the hospital Truly, I, I don't want to brag, but we kind of were way ahead of Austin in all of this. So I got a lot of patients, uh, a lot of patients from Austin. Some were students or some had just finished college. Yeah, so those, those were fun days. Where the rub came here, though, John, was when you were out of town. <laughs> <laughs> well, he made a big contribution. John Webb uh, uh, saw a real uh, opening in the field of uh, Lamaze and modern day obstetrics and took advantage of it. And uh, he, he used to tell me uh, how it's showbiz. He said, uh, and as a result, well, he got himself on some local TV programs and around and he had women coming from as far as uh, out of state for John to deliver them with Lamaze and various and sundry methods of obstetrics. He, he did a great job, but he was able to put it together with uh, his uh, ability to show, as he puts it, showbiz. I got this phone call one day, which was in 71, according to Mr. Poteet, from somebody called Miriam Kombach. And she said, could you be interested in coming and talking to me for just a little bit? 
And I, I said, okay. So I went in and we talked and she offered me this position of three days a week if I wanted to because at that time, Miss Munson was still there. She was going to work the other two. And so I said, well, I need to talk it with, up with my husband. And after uh, we discussed it, he said, okay. Of course, my children at that time were four and five, and Julie was going into kindergarten. So I had to make arrangements for them. And I went to work. And I think actually rather than three days, it was at least 20 hours a week. And sometimes I had to hunt for things to do with that 20 hours because I didn't have surgery every day. I managed, and then Ms. Munson became unavailable to work, and so I went to, uh, Janine Fairburn came and worked for her two days, and then she got to where she didn't want to continue working, so then it went to full time, which lasted then until the end of 92. Our kids were junior high age, and we wanted to get into Georgetown Independent School District, so we built a, ho a home here in Georgetown, and I went and interviewed with Miriam Comback uh, about uh, going to work up here and was hired to work two days a week, three to 11 supervisor as the, at that time, the way the hospital staffed on the three to 11 shift and the 11 to seven shift, there was one registered nurse on staff and the other nurses were LVNs. My two days a week often was a lot more than two days a week because the <laughs> nurse that uh, was the full-time nurse was not in good health. I often worked more than the, than the two days. And that, of course, was in the old hospital. And it was a great experience. It was unlike any kind of nursing I had ever done before <laughs> because it was a small hospital and we did everything. I had always worked in bigger hospitals where you they were departmentalized and you stayed in your own department and did your own thing and didn't occasionally go into the operating room <laughs> or the delivery room or emergency room because at that time on the 3 to 11 shift, it depended on w what activities were going on where I ended up. Uh, often it was in the emergency room because as the supervisor, I wasn't assigned specific patients, so I was the one that was free to go if there was a delivery or emergency room or occasionally to go down in the OR area until things got going. Although Ginger got called out morning, noon, and night, <laughs> weekends and everything in between. But it was certainly a learning experience. I learned to do all kinds of things. Back in the old days, actually up until 1972, our ambulances consisted of the hearses from the funeral homes. If there was a wreck, well, whoever got there first with the uh, hearse, if somebody was killed, they, they, they got the business right off the bat. That was some incentive for them to be available to go to wrecks and so forth. But they also carried people to the hospital uh, and took them back home and after operations and stuff like that. I think when we first started off, we all had to take that EMT and uh, Davis Film Home would uh, take uh, some of the bodies, you know. If somebody passed away, they'd come pick up the body. And then one of the nurses would have to help them load up and so at times you feel like you were jack of all trades. <laughs> Whatever they wanted you to do, you just get in there and do it. They had to have a certain amount of equipment, they had to have oxygen available and, and uh, rather stringent requirements if you're gonna act as an ambulance. So our funeral homes just gave notice that uh, no more ambulance service. So the county took it on the responsibility of, of uh, trying to get an ambulance service going. And uh, Ken Poteet and I one Sunday uh, got to talking about that and we, we came up with the idea of if the county would furnish the ambulance, we could park it at the hospital and our emergency room crew would 
if there was a call, they would man the ambulance, go out and get the patient, bring them into the emergency room. And there was no EMS service at all then either. So uh, that's how our Williamson County Ambulance Service got started. After finishing my residency, um, Barbara and I began to look for a place to practice. Um, Barbara's from West Texas. Um, I'm from Florida. Florida's wet. West Texas is obviously very dry. Uh, so we decided that we would strike a happy medium and find some place in the middle. We drove through uh, Georgetown and down to New Bronzeville in the spring of one year. And I don't know if any of you have ever, well, everybody has, I guess, have seen years when the blue bonnets are absolutely gorgeous. Well, that was the year that we came through. And I thought, this is the Garden of Eden. If I'd come through in August or September, I might not have, might not have been as impressed, but I was really impressed with the beauty, the natural beauty of the area. We, we visited a doctor down in um, New Bronzeville and decided that that was not where we wanted to practice. Um, on the way back, John Webb and, and um, Doug and um, James and Hal had put an ad in one of the medical um, journals. And we thought, well, we'll stop by and visit there while we're here. So we visited with John and John laid out what they were looking for and what the, what the possibilities were for me here. And uh, we both went home and thought, you know, we really would like to look at that place a little closer. Uh, at that point, we scheduled a second visit and Doug had us over to his house for supper. And Nell is an excellent cook. That's all you can say about it. She's really a good cook, but their hospitality was unequaled. And in talking to them, I, I became aware that these were the kind of people that I would like to practice medicine with. They, they had a real sense of community, uh, but they also were very interested in, in, in improving the quality of the medical facilities and the, the care that they gave. They were, they were interested not so much in making money as they were in taking care of, doing a good job of taking care of people. And uh, fortunately for me, my wife has always emphasized being happy more than making money. And so we decided that this was a good place for us to come. There were only three houses available in Georgetown. One was a, uh, two were spec houses that were in under construction or and the third was an old home on Main Street, uh, which we bought and subsequently redid. Uh, this proved to be both an advantage and a disadvantage. In the old days, if you lived in Georgetown, you either lived in Old Town or you lived in the new part of Georgetown, which was across the interstate, and there wasn't a whole lot there then. Well, being in Old Town exposed me to the local folks and I became part of the we became part of the community uh, and and that was a real help in building my practice the downside of it was that we were on the other side of the railroad tracks from the other four doctors in town and Texas Crest Stone would frequently uh, run a long train about 3 a.m along the tracks, which would effectively block Highway 29, the San Jose neighborhood. And so if John had a baby that had to be delivered or Doug couldn't get to the hospital because somebody was sick, um, I got a call in the middle of the night. <laughs> the, trains blocked the trains blocked the road and Dr. Webb's, one of his patients is here trying to have a baby. And so uh, I, I got I got a little breaking in a little earlier than I had wanted to break in, but it was it was fun and it, it turned out to be a real really good experience. And I've been here ever since. Uh, we I practiced medicine here for a total of thirty four years. 
I've never seen two men who stayed current in medicine the way they did. Often doctors finish their education and then they practice the, the way they were taught and that's sort of the end of their careers basically. But, but Doug and Hal always were reading journals, keeping up with new things in medicine and prodding us younger ones to, to go to meetings. Exactly. Go to meetings, go learn to do this, go learn how to do ultrasounds, go learn how to do new procedures. They were a terrific influence, terrific influence. We had a few specialists that came out and did cases and after we'd helped them a few times, we'd, an easy one we'd all we could do ourselves. It wasn't uh, like it is today, the super specialist, but <laughs> But I felt we had real good outcomes. By then we had Medicare and Medicaid. We had already added a new wing to our old hospital. That was in 65. And uh, we, needed, we, we needed somebody to be administrator. Hal really had taken most of the responsibility of the business part of the, of the partnership until that time, but it was just too much work. We needed an administrator bad. And Doug and James, doctors Benold and Shepard, and I made the decision we didn't know how to run a hospital. So we got the Texas Hospital Association recommended protein. Uh, after residency, I began work with the shared management system services of the Texas Hospital Association based in Austin, whose program was to serve and meet the needs of many hospitals, those who were members, uh, who requested some assistance at that point in time because of the advent of Medicare, which had been implemented in 1966. One of those hospitals that I worked with was a small 30-bed hospital with four family practice physicians in Georgetown, Texas. Those doctors were doctors Getty, Benno, Shepard, and Webb. And Ken came to us and he said, he looked us over and he applied for the job. And he said he could, he could save us enough in one year by taking that job um, that would pay his salary. Anyway, we were impressed with him and we hired him. And um, it was a, it was a wonderful, a wonderful uh, turnout for, for us. As a result of my work and involvement with these physicians and the community, we decided my wife and I, Susan, we decided uh, uh, that maybe a community of the size and type of Georgetown would be suitable for us for long-term growth. The, the physicians uh, offered me the opportunity to join them, uh, to help them in their desire to grow and meet the future healthcare needs of, of, of Georgetown. I was very happy to have an administrator. It was necessary to have a hospital administrator to run the hospital. We had to work very closely together to make it work, and, and it, we made it work. I joined the doctors and the hospital September 1, 1972. At that time, uh, if most of us can recall, Interstate 35 was only about officially six years old in terms of completion. Uh, growth had already uh, begun for the area, and uh, the need to replace the existing facility, at least uh, modify and expand it, of course, was was quite uh, 
evident and of major interest on the part of all of us. Our facility at the time uh, was 30 beds uh, with uh, uh, a north wing uh, L-shape that housed our administrative uh, and diagnostic area with the west wing uh, housing the patient rooms and the surgical suite area. The facility uh, was a combination of wooden structure of an older home-like building with the addition of the west wing. There was not an adequate amount of space uh, to really meet uh, what was apparent uh, to all of us of a need for additional room for all types and kinds of services. As we began, I was the administrator of the, their clinic for their outpatient services, as well as the administrator of the hospital, which were adjacent to one another on University Avenue. I've just been blessed to, to work, of course, with wonderful people. And that certainly started with Getty Beno Shepherd and uh, Webb and that group and, and Pierce. Uh, these gentlemen are just that. They're gentlemen, but they're also professionals. They did not overly demand. They were very practical and very realistic about uh, expectations. And with that endorsement or support, uh, we were able then to be somewhat visionaries and, and anticipate and not overly expect or overly indulge. My best place that I liked, and a lot of people didn't want to even go in there, was intensive care. And when we started off, we had a two-unit, two-bed intensive care, and it was on the first floor next to Mr. Poteet's office. <laughs> So he'd come in and check on me because nobody else wanted to come down. They'd even give me a lunch break sometime. We had good conversations. Bertie Shanklin, born in Georgetown, Texas, out in the Berry Creek area, so I always told everybody I was born in Berry Creek. I was uh, the third of third child of 10 kids. My mom and dad had six boys and four girls, and I was the oldest girl, the third, third child. I had two older brothers. And I always said a third time is a charm, so I consider myself the charm. And then Nora, she came on later. I worked at the uh, Westland Nursing Home eight years. It was my first real job besides picking cotton. But I did work at the Georgetown Hospital with Jim Eisenhower. Just a good old unit clerk, ward clerk. That's all I ever did, answer the phone and take the doctor's orders. And this is when Francis took over my life and trained me. <laughs> and I'm thankful to her. And Dr. Bernard had the worst writing. Dr. Bernard, Dr. Webb, Dr. Pierce. Dr. Uh, Shepard, Dr. Gaddy, it was like five of them. And I, I, I could be along with all of them, as long as they, you know, did what I told them. <laughs> <laughs> I worked at the hospital 23 years. Oh, okay. And now I'm a volunteer, and I've been volunteering on Fridays for 20 years, so I've been around the hospital 43 years. So Mimi Kalmbach, who's a nurse, head of nursing, uh, asked me at church one Sunday, she said, Francis, can we come over and see your house plans and see your house? And I said, sure. So they came over one night. We sh showed them their house plans. And then she said, I said, yeah, now we built this house. So I'm probably going to have to find a job. And she said, oh, um, OK. Um, I work at the hospital. I'm director of nursing there. And I knew all that. I only went to school nine years. I went eight grades in grade school, one year in high school in Belton, Texas. 
So Miriam asked me, she said, okay, I might, I might call you, you know, and I thought, oh yeah, right, with no education, you know, nine years of school. So sure enough, about a week and a half later, the phone rang and it was Mimi and it was like nine o'clock in the morning and she said, Francis, can you come to the hospital and help us? And that was out on university, you know, the little old two-story hospital. And uh, I said, okay. I said, when? You know, I'm thinking tomorrow. She said, oh, can you be here by two today? And I said, okay. <laughs> you know, what do I wear? And she said, oh, just anything. So I don't even remember what I wore or, you know, anything. But I went and she said, um, now all you have to do is the x-ray is really, really busy and they need help. Okay. So I said, I've never pushed a wheelchair. <laughs> And she said, okay, it's not hard. You, Carter Simmons is an x-ray, and we'll let you take the patients to x-ray. Well, they had one elevator, and it was a platform with four cables on it, and that's all. And me not driving a wheelchair with a patient in it was very scared to go up this elevator and down, but I did fine. So then um, several weeks later, she said, I'm going to start a unit clerk class. And so it was me and another lady who I knew that lived out in the country. She's a little older than I was. So her and I and three Southwestern students were in the first unit clerk class. All of this land over here, this was just a cow pasture, you know, back then. So we had groundbreaking. We built the hospital here. And so I was a unit clerk like Bertie, doing transcribing orders and putting them on the cardex and all this. And so then as we grew, we got a switchboard downstairs because we'd answer the phone upstairs in the first and second floor. And um, Ms. Kalmbach asked us, she says, now I'm going to need switchboard operators. So, okay, I, she thought I could be one, so I did. But anyway, I started working at the hospital in 68. I'm still here. I work two days a week. I still love it. I have no plans in quitting, and I guess that's my story. Something that was very apparent to me, though, and I was so young that I'm not sure whether this was instilled by my mother or whether I picked it up from being in town, but that my father was immensely respected. To really, really be an effective primary care doctor, to really be that kind of a physician, you had to be married to medicine. Medicine had to be number one. I had learned to accept that's, that's, part, of, that's part of the way it is. Uh, I probably decided as, as for sure as early as junior high school that I was going to go to medical school. That's the real reason that I became a doctor because I wanted to have the life that my father had. I wanted to have the respect and the community position that he had. I really enjoyed the old hospital. I think moving to the new hospital, it, it was nice, and certainly the community needed it. The old hospital just had a feeling about it uh, of, of comfort and being home and lots of memories of community, you know, of patients that had come in and gotten well and gone home. For me, it was the relationships, uh, in a lot of ways, relationships with the staff, the nurses. Uh, we were a team, as Miriam has said often, everybody worked together and you knew you could count on them if you needed them. And that was really from the, the housekeeping staff to the pharmacy to the the nurses and the doctors. And the other thing was the patients. I think it's a real joy to be able to take care of patients that you know and to greet them and to then have them see you in the grocery store later and, and you ask how they're doing. I mean, to be able to, to know your patients is, is, for me, was a real wonderful thing and a very special thing. I want to make the point about Doug and James and Hal's commitment to the com community. And this is the best story I know. <clears throat> when we decided it was time to build a new hospital, and um, 
we were researching our options and how to do it, um, a group from Hospital Corp of America came and visited with us. And they wanted to essentially <clears throat> buy our practices out and buy the hospital out. At that time, we, the four of us owned the hospital. And they wanted to buy the hospital. They would build us a new hospital and a new clinic building by the hospital. And uh, they were offering us a, a nice sum of money and a lot of stock options and, and other things. And uh, Doug and James and Hal uh, kept saying, well, but what are you going to do with the people that don't have any insurance? And oh, we'll take care of them. Don't worry. We'll, you know, that, that. And, and but they kept saying, well, specifically, how do you mean you're going to take care of them? Are you going to treat them here? Are you going to let us treat them? Well, you know, if, if they need to, we can send them to Austin or, or, yeah. And so we didn't even consider, they didn't, and I was part of that, but we didn't consider it because we didn't feel like they would continue to care for the community and that they would just take care of patients with insurance or with means and the others would be shipped out to either back to Brackenridge or to Scott and White or somewhere else. So we did not accept their offer, and then Ken Petit put together the hospital authority and raised the bond money, and, and we stayed in independent practice. And immediately after he came, we realized that our, our private hospital was going to be inadequate pretty soon because we were growing, the town was beginning to grow a little bit, but we were attracting people from all over the county uh, coming to Georgetown for medical care. So we started talking about building a new hospital. We didn't think we could swing it from a financial standpoint privately. So we were working on the idea of a nonprofit hospital that the city would would own, the people would own. But Ken, uh, Ken worked uh, with us to, uh, to find a, uh, a loan to build in the hospital and we, uh, we, we formed a hospital board of local citizens and uh, wonderful people that served on the board. There were five members of that board uh, appointed by the, the board as a whole and four by the city. The president of the board was uh, Mr. Jay Sloan. Uh, vice president was Mr. Charles Forbes. Secretary of the board was Mr. Wallace Evans. The members at large were uh, Drs. Gaddy and Ben O, uh, Elmer Fredrickson, Dr. Bob McKay, Mr. Don Hewlett, Mr. Basil Phillips. Buster Compton, uh, who owned the Civil A agency here in town, was the chairman of the drive to raise the money. Our task was to raise $350,000 out of the community for the, for the new hospital. Now I figured that we'd maybe get half of that or two-thirds of it and then the rest of it would get real slow and I was making some preparation to what the next presentation of the Farm and Home Administration people would be in case we were short. And uh, lo and behold, the momentum built and built and built and uh, we just passed over our mark uh, considerably and uh, as I recall, that passed from $350,000 to about $500,000 when, when, um, when the movement stopped. We had great community participation. We started building that new hospital, I think about in 1978. So to have a new building on I-35 and be that visible was just a, a thrill.
In June of 1979, a ribbon-cutting ceremony welcomed the community to its new facility. Supporters of the new facility flocked inside to see what they had helped build. As in the past, Georgetown Hospital has continued to grow with the community. Well, when I came on the board, it had already gone through this transition. But one of the important steps in the growth and development of Georgetown Hospital was the fact that, that the doctors donated the old hospital and its assets to the community. It was a very generous act on the part of the doctors. They continued to support the hospital, help it to grow as a community grew down through the years. James and, and Doug and Hal donated the land and they had a big campaign in Georgetown. I think is one reason it's such a great place. Every club in town would donate their money and even if it was $200, you know, and people made pledges, but they raised enough to build that three-story hospital. And of course, it's been in renovating and adding to ever since. But it was a big deal. We were awful proud of it, to have that nice new hospital. There was no specialist in Georgetown until the new hospital opened. When that hospital opened, every man on the staff was a general practitioner or a family practitioner. But having Ken Hunt and Al Bartschmidt come in, and then later all the different specialties came in, it was so nice to be able to keep our patient in the hospital where we could continue to care for them. It was a real boon for the medical care in Georgetown to have those specialists. As a result, with our growth and with our excellent hospital, I think we can attract many, many more specialists. I don't think that there are, that there are many people uh, who wouldn't choose to go to a specialist, and I think that trend will continue. Opened my practice September 1st of, of 79, and uh, so uh, had a solo practice. And, you know, the, the family doctors here who had served the community for years and years, they, they did surgery maybe not quite the magnitude of some of the surgeries that I had been trained to do. But there was a fear that they might be reticent about somebody coming, and, and I wasn't very busy for the first year. <laughs> Turned out that all eight of us became good working colleagues, and several of us became very good friends. You know, I was here, I wasn't trying to steal cases from them, call me if you need me, and I think that's what made it go. I made myself available. I was here two and a half years without ever having a day off. Not that I was working 24 hours a day, but I was available. And I think the guys respected that. After the first year, uh, I was about as busy as, as I could be until I retired about 22 years later. I got here in uh, 19... 83. Um, it's, it's really the only job I've ever had um, as a doctor. It's, um, so I feel real blessed to hit a home run uh, the first place I landed because that's pretty unusual uh, to go one place and, and stay. We moved ourselves in the moving van and arrived on the 4th of July, and it was the typical 102 degrees. I remember the very first day unloading our van. I was drenched in sweat. And this bespeckled guy comes over with his hands in his pockets and introduced himself, and it's Tom Baumfalk. And <laughs> he tells me who he is, and he says, there's a lady just came in with a broken hip. You ready for to do some work? And so I already had my hospital credentials and everything, so I kind of left uh, my wife to start unpacking boxes and went over and fixed the hip. Hadn't even un unpacked yet, so... 
that was kind of encouraging. And when you first start, you know, you do wonder, am I going to be able to make a living? And so I got off to a good start there. But little by little, again, just being available and not being pushy, the, it, you know, it becomes easier and easier for them just to send me all the orthopedics, which they did. Our youngest was born here. Uh, John Webb delivered him. Everything went well, and Susan's uh, Scroban was their pediatrician, and who's been in the area for a long time. You know, I, I would say that she was as good a pediatrician as I've ever come across. And I would say Ken Hunt is as good a general surgeon as I've ever been around, and I'm not the only one to have come to that same conclusion. I was a charge nurse, but there were other nurses because you can't do it with just one. Gertrude Satterfield and Rena Petty were the instrument nurses when I first went to work. Uh, they were both LVNs. When there was surgery, they would come in and scrub and hand the instruments. And then after this case, then they would go back out on the floor and do floor nursing. My favorite part, a lot of it, I think, was the people that I was working with. I was very comfortable around them. It was nice for people to come up to my husband and ask, is your wife going to be working in surgery on such and such a day? And they would say, he'd tell them yes. And he said, why? Well, some member of their family was going to have surgery, and they wanted to be sure that I was going to be there. I thought that was very nice. We were all comforted when you were yeah. on duty if we yeah. had to be in your operating room. <laughs> yeah. I was a new employee that just the year before in infection control. And part of that is being like a detective, trying to find out what's causing the problem and then what do you do to prevent it. And all of a sudden in June or the end of May, I guess, it was actually the second year that this had happened, we began having a, a series of gastrointestinal illnesses among patients coming into the emergency room. And it just got to be more and more and more. And the health department got involved and they began to look for the source. And it took them about two to three weeks, I believe, before they discovered that it was in the water and there was a high fecal coliform count in the Georgetown water supply. Well, I lived west of town, but the choir, the church choir, had a Christmas party that night in a, in a residence in Old Town. And so I woke up with stomach cramps and diarrhea, and it was pretty apparent that Everybody in town was having this. We had a couple of uh, CDC epidemiologists that came to Georgetown, and I was the point person for the hospital in that we had to collect stool samples from these patients to see if we could find out what the, the organism was that was causing it. And uh, people were really sick, and it was really hot, and they were drinking more and more water. Uh, I remember people in our neighborhood were out mowing their yards, and they'd go get the hose and drink more water. I actually got a vial of Finergan, which is an anti-nausea agent, and had my wife give it to me, give me, because she's a nurse, you know, and she gave me this shot of Finergan and got me to the office. And of course, the office was just, it was just chaos. Everybody was sick. I still was feeling pretty poor, and so at lunch, I went across the street and asked one of the paramedics to start an IV on me and give me a liter of normal saline to perk me up so I could keep practicing. There were, I think there was nothing else going on in the world at that particular time because we were inundated with news organizations from all over, from Houston. And then all of a sudden people kind of began to get the idea that it could be the water, even though officials weren't declaring that. And there was a run on uh, water, bottled water at the grocery store and they would come in and they would film the empty shelves of water. So it, it was really, it was funny. There were a lot of funny things about it. It was also serious and uh, it was funny. I said I was a member of the uh, Austin Area Infection Control Group and the, 
The CDC is sort of like the guru of anything, any kind of epidemic. And so to be able to have a, a CDC investigator come to your community was a really big deal. The infection control nurse at Scott and White called one if I needed him to come down and help me. And all the Austin nurses were saying, do you need us to come up and help? because they wanted to work with the CDC. Well, what I was doing was not particularly fun and it was not like a big deal. So I'll, I'll never forget on June the 18th, which was my birthday, I had a cardboard box full of stool samples that I had to take into the Texas Department of Health because they were to test and we had already made all the arrangements so I had to deliver them. Well, as I pulled up into the Health Department parking lot, there was a, a KVU 24 news truck and the anchor going in the front door. And I thought, I do not want to be on TV carrying my <laughs> box of stool samples. <laughs> so I kind of snuck around into the side and asked where the lab was and took it back to the lab. Well, the next day was Juneteenth and the state offices were closed. And this was sometime after lunch and the lab person said, well, we won't be able to get to these till Monday. And I went, oh no, you have to be able to, to culture these because they need culturing today and we've already made all those arrangements. Well, he was really not very helpful at all. And I said, you know what? Channel 24 is outside in your lobby. And if you would like, I can take these samples out and explain that the Texas Department of Health is not going to culture our samples. <laughs> And he looked at me and he said, really? And I said, really? And we have all kinds of news media in our community. And he said, we'll see what we can do, Miss Pierce. We'll try to get them done right away. So they did. Well, the next day, my nurse came in wide-eyed and she said, there's a TV crew from WFAA in Dallas that wants to, to interview you. And I went, oh God. So I would go in my little office and sit there and They'd say, well, doctor, what's going on? And I'd go, da, 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 da. And then I'd run and see some more patients. And she'd say, there's a KHOU from Houston is here. They want to interview. Okay, run back to my office. Do like this with these lights, you know. And, and It was really quite an interesting experience. It took about six weeks to kind of get to the root of it. And then we began to see follow-ups. We had 30 cases of hepatitis. I had to do a lot of phone calls and follow-up with patients. The New York Times published a cartoon of a little guy in a sombrero saying, I just visited Georgetown, Texas, and it's such a fun place, but don't drink the water. This was in the New York Times, so it, it was a slow news week, and we were, we were hitting the newspapers everywhere. One of my residency friends taped some Imodium samples to a card and mailed it to me and said, I hope this helps. You know? but it was quite a, a memorable time in my career and in the community. <laughs>
a really, really good uh, communication and interaction with the CEO, with Mr. Petit. Because without him, you cannot do anything. So we went back to him and uh, we said, you know, you've got this nice hospital now and uh, we could really contribute a lot to the hospital. So would you consider letting us start an auxiliary? He looked at us, he said, you girls, he said, I'll tell you what, if you get this thing started, you are gonna, st you may not start it and leave. You need to stay here until I retire. <laughs> or, you know, in other words, you can't start it and then go find something else you wanna do. So we did actually sign in blood that we would stay <laughs> forever as long as he was there. And so that was the we beginning did. of it. And uh, once we got started, I mean, we, we got cracking. Polly Cooper was really, she was our motivational person. And so we talked to her and she said, okay, you need to have a formation meeting and get some people together and see how many are really interested in doing this. So we met at the uh, first Texas building. Uh, Jay Sloan was in, had some authority there and he said, you can use our big room. And Joe Sloan, of course, his wife was also interested in the auxiliary. So uh, we uh, sent out word that we were gonna have this formation meeting. Our tennis players had all sort of gotten interested in playing and, and, and doing the auxiliary. And we said, everybody needs to bring 10 <laughs> names of people that would be interested in the auxiliary. And so they got word out to their 10 names and that first formation meeting, there were 60 ladies that showed up. And Polly Cooper, was the speaker. And so she told us what was involved. And I mean, they were re you know, ready and raring to go. I mean, we were connected. We loved those ladies. We played tennis with those ladies. We were in other things with those ladies. Church with them. We were at church with the ladies. So they were sweet. And I've got to share this. There were two women that showed up a week ahead of time to be a pink lady. <laughs> Uh, we had we had everything rolling, and they were so excited that they showed up one the week, week early. And nothing, of course, we weren't ready yet. But they were the cutest ladies, and we said, "Come back next week. We'll be ready to roll." But anyway, that was kind of a neat thing. I was dean of students from 1979 to. The early 90s. When we came here, we knew this was a very unique place. We had come up and looked at Georgetown, and um, I'll say when I would, after my mother died, I determined that if I ever had a chance to work in a hospital, I was going to do that. Right. So uh, when the hospital, I came over and began to get to know people in the hospital and met Mr. Poteet that particular time, the president of Southwestern was Derwood Fleming, who was a pastor in Houston, St. Luke's. And so he was very open in terms of anything that we wanted to do was fine. I mean, he, he all he said was, well, are you gonna stay around here, Barbara? Or are you just gonna come in and then move off? And I said, no, we're here to stay. And so I approached Mr. Poteet in terms, of, I, I had been asked to be on the board as, um, on the board of the hospital, and I accepted that. And then I began to ask Mr. Poteet about, well, what about chaplains? I mean, we're a secular hospital, but we could, we could work this out. Will you go visit the Georgetown Minister Alliance, and if those, they were all men at that time, if those men say that they would be supportive of you of us doing this, well then, that'll be okay. But it has to go on, it can't just, you know, stop and start, a volunteer chaplaincy. You know, I called around to other hospitals asking about, well, I don't really know anything about a volunteer program in a hospital, but I can learn, so will you help me? And they said, we don't know anything about a volunteer, you just have a chaplain. And so I said, well, Mr. Poteet is not gonna fund the chaplaincy. He said, you know, you go, you went to a seminary, you just start it, and so on. Okay, give me a challenge and I'm after it. So, visited with the seven 
uh, seven of our pastors in town after being a part of the Minister Alliance. And they said, well, we think that's a really good idea. And I said, well, I need your help in several ways. And one would be for you to be on the pastoral care team. And so seven of them stepped up and said, we will do that. We will take time out of our schedules to be sure that we vi visit all the people in the hospital. And so I'm just thinking that the Holy Spirit was in charge of this whole thing. And so you just try to follow the Spirit. And we had seven show up and make a commitment. And they did an absolutely marvelous job. Well, I started out in 1984 um, as part-time ICU, part-time evening supervisor. And I had actually only been here a few months that I was asked if I would start a home health agency for the hospital. And um, home health agencies were very new. They had just been approved to get Medicare funding and it was going to be a quantum shift in we weren't going to keep those patients in the hospital for extended periods. We were going to bring care to their homes. And it was hard to get people to agree to let you come in to their homes and take care of them. We had a, a great volunteer, Doris Cromer, who had a master's in social work. And she was willing to be our social worker for the home health agency. And from a blank sheet of paper, we had our first uh, home health agency. The mandate was that I had to have the first patient admitted before the end of the year. And so we admitted our first patient on December 22nd. So it was quite fast tracked. The hospital, again, because of the change in reimbursement, was encouraging doctors to discharge patients quicker when it was appropriate and make sure that the patients had some additional assistance. Rehab facilities had not been created back then. And there's been, just over my career in nursing, so much change. I feel a little bit prouder about my career with the EMS because I was sort of there at the beginning. And I was the, the medical director for 32 years. But the best we can figure from 1975 when the EMS started to 1978 when I came to Georgetown, they didn't have a medical director. Uh, and that's because they did only what are called basic life support things. In other words, they didn't carry drugs, they didn't have cardiac monitors, and so they didn't really need a medical director. By 1978, three years into it, they were getting more and more sophisticated and needed a physician who could write prescriptions for those drugs and to, to be officially in charge because the laws of the state of Texas basically say a physician is the only person that can practice medicine. You can delegate that to nurses and paramedics and other people under your supervision, but only a physician can practice. And so they came to me and uh, asked if I would be the medical director. Uh, John Sneed and Kenny Schnell were, you know, they were just young paramedics then. And George Stevenson was the administrative director. And they said, would you be our medical director? And it was sort of like the old Soviet Union. I pretended to work and they pretended to pay me. <laughs> I did it for free for 20 years. When I started as a nursing supervisor on the 3 to 11 shift, we had one LVN staffed in the emergency room. And if the ambulance or EMS got a call, that nurse left with the ambulance. 
And that meant the nursing supervisor, no matter what was going on in the rest of the building, stopped what they were doing and went to staff the ER. And many days that wasn't a problem, but some days it was quite stressful. And we actually very early on at Georgetown created a position called Flex, which was kind of like a float person. I think that Georgetown having, Georgetown Hospital having had EMS housed in our facility from the time this facility was built um, gave us a really unique opportunity. We were highly involved with the community in EMS. Having the paramedics and having the EMS system part of the facility was a great benefit to us. Probably in the early 90s, we were to the point that we were staffing two paramedics around the clock. Helicopter transfers were always a unique situation. Um, in the entire time I was at Georgetown, we never had a real helipad. And so we'd have to call the fire department and they'd come out and create a landing zone marked off with fire trucks and police cars. It was always quite exciting and cars would stop whenever a, a helicopter was landing. I think one of the most memorable helicopter transfers that I ever recall was a house fire in part of the rural part of the county and five family members were brought here. It was very clear that they were not going to be able to stay here. They needed to go to, to San Antonio to the burn center. And the military sent two military transfer helicopters. They were huge and they made a lot of noise and I think about 10 staff people arrived on those helicopters. It was just amazing to watch them work and to know that all those patients got excellent care that they needed and the whole family got transferred uh, to San Antonio together. By 1987, to continue to serve the community and its healthcare needs, Georgetown Hospital, under the leadership of Ken Putit, became the central facility of a newly formed Georgetown healthcare system. This truly expanded the vision beyond traditional healthcare boundaries to best serve residents of Georgetown and Williamson County. With the construction of the Del Webb Sun City development, Georgetown began to experience changing demographics. In 1994, after celebrating 15 years of serving the community in its current location, the Georgetown Hospital Board and leadership team began planning for major expansion and renovations. Georgetown Hospital, I think, has always been blessed with an incredible leadership team, leadership both in our community board and Ken Poteet's longevity. I mean, it is unheard of for a CEO to be at a facility for 30 years. It doesn't happen in hospitals. There's a lot of movement. And I think that the two things that helped economically is that the board and Ken and the whole administrative team, we all had vision that the community was growing and we had to grow or someone would come in that, was, that saw the opportunity if we didn't. From the uh, construction of the, of the facility at, at its current location up and through into the 90s and, and early 2000s, there was uh, seven or eight expansion segments during that period of time. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Barbara Brightwell was named Director of Development to assist in the creation of the Georgetown Healthcare Foundation, which included recruiting board members and writing a capital campaign feasibility study. The foundation, created to support the healthcare system's future in the community and led by Dr. Jesse Buzz Sawyer, soon began a $2.5 million capital campaign to raise funds for expansion and construction. A very successful employee campaign involving clinical and support staff throughout the hospital, as well as medical staff, kicked off the fundraising effort. Once again, community support became critical to ensure that the needs of our rapidly expanding area could be met. Donations, large and small, came from businesses and individuals across our community, as well as Northern Williamson County. Significant gifts from longtime Georgetown philanthropists, including the Grogan Lord Foundation, Marvin and Weta Henderson and son Marvin Jr., as well as newer residents, including Jack and Cammie Gary, and Del Webb's Sun City supported this campaign. Georgetown Hospital's auxiliary annual support from their fundraising activities funded new equipment purchases. Georgetown residents appreciated being able to receive care in the community and felt that Georgetown Hospital was their hospital. As a result, millions of dollars were raised to ensure that the most up-to-date facilities and new diagnostic and surgical technology were available in our community. For years, Georgetown residents had to travel into Austin for specialized chemotherapy or radiation therapy. One phase of the hospital expansion included a cancer center. Dr. Jack Cromer, a Georgetown resident, was a pioneer in the medical physics community and established one of the first laboratories for nuclear medicine in the Southwest. Dr. Cromer was instrumental in the design and development of Georgetown's new cancer center, which allowed patients needing cancer treatment to receive their care in Georgetown. I'm Hillel Benave. I'm a uh, native Texan from Houston and came back to, to Austin and joined with a uh, group called Austin Radiology that serves this whole area. And uh, pretty shortly after I got back to Texas in 1996, I went to work for Austin Radiology and they sent me out here to be sort of the you know, the primary radiologist at uh, what was then Georgetown Hospital. It was a small community hospital that had, uh, you know, the typical imaging equipment that, that a hospital of its size, about a hundred or so bed hospital would, would have, CT scanner, ultrasound. Uh, we didn't have magnetic resonance imaging back then. That, that was standard for a hospital of that size. CAT scans and nuclear medicine scanning, as new technologies came along and were added to the hospital, we were constantly looking for, where can we squeeze this in? We want to bring this technology to town and we want to be able to keep the patients here in Georgetown. but. Uh, we just literally were running out of floor space. When, when I started out here back in, in 97, uh, CT scanners had just what's called one ring of detectors to put out the x-ray and detect the x-ray that was coming out of the patient's body. Now they've gotten to the point where they've got 64 of these rings of detectors. So, I mean, the technology for CT scanning has just, you know, gotten much, much better in the last 20 years, much faster. Um, we have got an MR scanner here. Uh, 
Uh, we're actually getting rid of our MR scanner and getting a brand new one. They're um, starting construction down in the radiology department to put that new scanner in. It's going to be, um, uh, in, in addition to being faster, the, the big things with MR scanners, they used to be very narrow, tubular things. There's still a tube, but they're manufacturing the, the tube with a much bigger diameter, and therefore people don't feel like they're being you know, shoved into a torpedo tube when they get into one these days. So it's a heck of a lot nicer. And this this thing's going to have um, radio frequency protected um, earphones and everything. It's going to be like going to the spa. I, I just I, I like what I do. It's, it's even though it's having to uh, to deal with people who are sometimes, you know, in distress, it what I do is actually just fun. I have to look at at images that are, um, you know, not like the typical things you're looking at with your eyes and try to find the abnormality. It's like a great game of Where's Waldo and I get to play it and get paid. By 2000, the population of Georgetown was nearing 30,000 people. Hospital CEO Ken Potit was instrumental in supporting the incubation of several collaborative outreach projects related to community health. The construction of the Brightwell Chapel in honor of Barbara and George Brightwell and an expanded chaplain's program. The Georgetown Project a new nonprofit organization focused on the healthy development of children and youth, hosting a variety of support groups for patients, families, and caregivers before these were the norm in smaller communities. And the Community Resource Center, a co-location of community agencies utilizing the old hospital building on University Avenue. With support from the Georgetown Health Foundation, the Community Resource Center, or CRC, later expanded into a renovated office building on the corner of University and Scenic that currently houses eight nonprofit organizations serving a variety of needs in our community. She was a master at bringing people together to really address needs that she found among kids and families and primarily in her school. Toward the end of her career, certainly health was a huge issue for her in terms of she had kids who there was no resources for them to access medical care. For many years, she would call on her friends that were doctors to see these kids. But we had grown to the point where that was really no longer feasible. And after she had retired as a principal, she still worked in the schools. But she wanted to see a community clinic where children could have access to health care. The hospital was a place where we met, and she called on her friends, which she was always great about convincing you that she had a project that you just could not turn down. She had this, this really fire in her belly to make something happen in terms of health care for children in the school district that did not have any kind of medical home brought in other people that really helped make that happen. And at that point in time, the old family practice clinic across the street from the old hospital was vacant. And since it was set up for a medical clinic, Joanne convinced everybody that it needed to be the, the Georgetown Community Clinic. And people like Herb, like Sue Smith, who was an RN that was retired, uh, Marjorie Herbert, who was a local lawyer who had retired and another real community activist, uh, were all members of the board. And then Doug and uh, Benold and James Shepard had retired from private practice at the time, and they were volunteer physicians at that clinic. And it became a reality. But I think also the realization that Georgetown was growing so fast and the need was so great that sustaining it through community contributions and with volunteers was probably not going to 
happen in terms of long-term sustainability. So that's when they begin to look at the possibility of applying for federally qualified health care status, which gave enhanced reimbursement and helped very much with the funding. The clinic applied for that uh, designation and received it. And then ultimately, over the next four or five years, uh, developed into what is now Lone Star Circle of Care. And the story continues. At the dawn of the 21st century, new leaders in healthcare emerge in Georgetown. Rapid population growth in Williamson County triggered a boom in the medical and hospital industry in Central Texas. In 2007, Dell Children's Hospital became the first dedicated hospital for children in this area. So from Mary Harden Baylor, I went to Hillcrest Baptist Medical Center in Waco for a year uh, administrative residency. And my preceptor at the time was a man named Richard Scott. And he was a classmate of Ken Poteet at Trinity University in San Antonio. So I interviewed with Ken and in January of 1999, I joined uh, Georgetown Hospital as an ins assistant vice president starting their outpatient uh, radiation therapy center which was called the Georgetown Cancer Treatment Center. And then progressively over time, because of my business background, culminated my time there as the Chief Operating Officer at Georgetown Hospital. So I worked with, with Ken Poteet and Larry Jimenez, and then our board of directors, Dr. Schaefer, Dr. Brightwell, to identify a partner for Georgetown Hospital. Because we were really in a a very competitive environment. And as a community hospital, one of the major impediments to continued growth is access to capital. And we were at a point where new hospitals were being built all around us and it would, we felt like it was in the best interest of the community to partner with someone who could make continued investments to improve the clinical sophistication to benefit the patients and, and our community members. And we as we're, are known as St. David's Georgetown Hospital, wherein we have a minority interest as a partner in the partnership with now Hospital Corporation of America, as well as with St. David's. We are able then to continue to provide first-class mainstream medical acute care services for the area. I actually got my first job in healthcare for an HCA facility in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Found out early on that I I loved healthcare. In fact, it surprised me. I found that even though I'm not clinical at all, um, I really honestly don't care that much for the sight of blood or the smells of healthcare, but I knew, I felt like I had a role. I felt like the work I was doing um, was for a cause greater than just drawing a paycheck. And so I, I committed to, uh, to seeing how far that would take me. And finally, one day, uh, an email came across uh, to all the executives. They send them out every two weeks that list all the new executive openings in HCA hospitals around the country. And there was only one new thing. It said St. David's Georgetown Hospital, Georgetown, Texas. This was in the fall of 2006. And I thought my first thought was, well, Texas, I'm not interested in Texas. I've seen it on TV, never been there, not interested in living in the desert. But being the man that I am, I'd always try to do the right thing. And I would forward those emails to my wife to see if maybe I was interested in something. And sure enough, I, uh, I, so I sent the e email to her and she called me 10 minutes later and she goes, she goes, I saw that job. And I said, what job? And she said, the one in, in uh, the, the one, the new one on the list. I said, oh, the one in Texas. I said, we're not interested in Texas. All our families on the East Coast. She goes, no, no, no. I know Georgetown. I said, well, how do you know Georgetown? She said, well, I read about it in Southern Living Magazine because they've just redone their courthouse and it's beautiful. 
So I uh, interviewed for the job in the fall of 2006, and I started at the end of February in 2007. St. David's acquired it in May of 2006. Ken Petit stayed on as the CEO until to kind of help in the transition. So as I still tell people, um, even after many years here, I tell people I'm still the new guy because Mr. Petit had been here for well over 30 years. So he's got a lot more experience than I do doing this. So every day we keep trying to, to live up to that. Georgetown health care system is now a, a, a part of Georgetown Health Foundation, the minority partner with St. David's and with Hospital Corporation America. Those proceeds then go through the Georgetown Health Foundation so that we can give back this community to all these nonprofit programs that are currently being supported through the benevolence of the Healthcare Foundation. Based on the transaction, we were given a substantial amount of resources and no real charge or direction or mission related to how we would use those assets. So it was very much a blank slate. The opportunity to be a part of that conversation, of thinking about how you would use substantial resources to improve the health of the community, that seemed like really a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. So it came in, um and, uh, and immediately recognized that, uh, that there, was, there was opportunity. Uh, you know, I was directly connected through St. David's and HCA to um, some of the leading edge in, in quality and patient safety, equipment. My, my tasking, I distinctly remember this, I, when I was interviewed for the job and then had had a few weeks under my belt and I was sitting down with Mr. John Foster, who was the division president of uh, St. David's. And I, I asked him, I said, John, what would success look like to, for me? What do you want me to do as the leader of this organization? Understanding the legacy, understanding the long history of serving the community. He said, well, he said, you know, this is, this is a unique acquisition by St. David's. Um, it's the only hospital within the St. David system that actually has its own community. He said, one of the things that attracted St. David's to this facility was it was Georgetown's only hospital. And, and he said, so, I want you to bring the level of quality and service at that hospital up to the St. David's level, which I didn't recognize at that point was actually extraordinarily high. It was the highest standards, um, as high or higher than anything else that I'd ever seen anywhere else I'd been in HCA. St. David sits atop virtually everything from quality and safety and patient satisfaction and performance. And he said, never, ever, ever lose the Georgetown feel. He said, recognize that, that you're going to be um, in a community that is very proud of their facility. They donated to the facility. It was, started by, it was started by physicians in the community who were giving of themselves to that. And he says, and that's unique. Certainly there's been, there's been tens of millions of dollars invested since I got here. Um, St. David's has, has fulfilled its, its obligation um, that it took on when it assumed um, the responsibility for this hospital. Lots of people here long before I was here. They were, they were part of the old Georgetown hospital culture and they recognize they're taking care of their neighbors. They're just really embracing the fact that we are the Georgetown Hospital. I love it. I, I feel like it kind of felt, it was like a God thing in my situation because I'd never even heard of the hospital um, looking for a job and, you know, moved here. And it had that small town feel that I'm used to from, you know, the small town I grew up in. So to me, it's, I just feel, you know, like I fit here. I notice when I'm feeling sad, like to help other people really makes me, I know it's cliche, but like it really makes me feel better. When I get anxious, I'm just like, okay, what can I do? I can make someone else smile. And so that's my job every day, like to comfort anxious mothers, to help that patient that's in pain. Like that's, that's, that's my job and I, I love it. I feel like I will always be here. I feel blessed that I literally got my first choice as my first job. During this time, changes enhancing patient access to health care occurred at an alarming pace, both nationally and here at home. In 2010, President Obama's Affordable Care Act was passed by Congress. Obamacare dramatically increased access to care by improving health care systems and giving millions of Americans an opportunity for health care coverage. With new health facilities throughout the area, the need for additional medical education programs became critical. In a short span of years, Texas State University and Austin Community College opened nursing programs in Round Rock. In 2009, the Texas A&M Health Science Center opened a medical and nursing education facility built on land donated by the Avery family located just 10 miles from Georgetown. 
In July 2016, Dell Medical School at the University of Texas opened its doors on the site of Austin's first hospital, built in 1884. On, on the Round Rock campus here at Texas A&M, we have 50 students in their third year and 50 students in their fourth year. Uh, and starting in the summer of 2016, we will have second year students on campus. We have our students scattered over three counties, four health systems, 22 hospitals, and literally hundreds of clinics, big and small. We are what are sort of called a community campus. And that is we use preceptors who are practicing active community physicians. I think it has a lot of advantages. Um, these are people who are actively engaged in the daily practice of medicine. We've just looked at our simulation center. Very, very different than when I went to medical school. Um, we practiced a little on each other and we practiced a lot on poor and suspecting patients um, 35 years ago. Many of the things that we teach our medical students now, especially procedurally, we practice on mannequins. And we have a number of high fidelity mannequins that can simulate almost every situation. Uh, I was telling the folks earlier um, that we kill them on a regular basis. And the wonderful thing is we bring them right back to life and we do it again. And we can practice the same scenario or multiple scenarios over and over and over again until it becomes second nature to students. Um, so that, that kind of a learning environment, the ability to be able to use simulation in lots of different ways has changed medicine. I uh, went to school at TCU for undergrad and um, am currently a third year medical student here at Texas A&M. My name is Emil Koja and I'm from Sugarland, Texas. I went to Texas A&M University for undergrad and I stayed there and attend medical school there now and I'm a third year student here. They put us in, in, in situations early on to be breaking bad news to somebody really making us start thinking about the human interaction aspect of medicine and not just, I hope you're good at it, but we're going to teach you to be good at it. So they make sure that the students they get are students that have a genuine interest and desire to take care of their patients. At NOB Gen, they actually have a simulator that delivers a baby and makes like screaming noises and things. Um, so it's, a, it's pretty cool just to uh, go through the whole process. It's, it's, there's a lot of steps to it. It's not just catching a baby. And my first day having a vaginal delivery, a C-section, an ectopic pregnancy, and another vaginal surgery in the midst of seeing patients in clinic, it was like, this is awesome. <laughs> so it's, it's fun and a good experience to start imagining that, you know, we'll be able to do that mm -hmm. <laughs> in real life eventually. I imagine that Emil will agree with me and that the, the best part of this job is the patients. They're learning tools for us, um, but, but it, we get to be part of their lives really in this and um, it's pretty cool. Working with patients is by far the best part of medicine for me. Um, so my experiences with patients have been fantastic. Like, you know, after a long day, it feels nice to have a patient say, you know, you're going to be a great doctor <laughs> one day. <laughs> Things like that really help us get through the day. Mm -hmm. By 2015, changes in healthcare were occurring rapidly in Georgetown as well. The Georgetown Fire Department assumed responsibility for emergency services for the Georgetown area allowing Williamson County to move their ambulances to underserved areas in northern Williamson County. We had enjoyed for decades, in fact, the, the relationship with the Williamson County EMS, it actually got its, its it was formed here. Um, Mr. Petit and the group actually started Williamson County EMS at this hospital. And so this year has been an interesting transition for us because uh, the, the Georgetown Fire um, Department has taken over the EMS services. I'm just with about a, about six weeks under our belt. We've we've made the transition, and we've we're working very closely with the the fire department EMS crews to make sure that the level of care that's provided in the field, the way the patients are brought to us, is uh, the same caliber uh, that we that the patients received before. And it's been it's been good. It's really been a good solid solid relationship. I think the fire department is committed to doing a um, a great job with that. 
really what hospitals of the future are going to be, in my opinion, and, th and we're perfectly positioned to do this, is here in meeting the community's needs for increasingly critical services. So we were very fortunate five years ago to recruit two um, really regionally, if not nationally known, intensivists, and those are critical care doctors, interventional pulmonologists, Dr. DeCartree and Dr. Fields, who came as a team to us and, and really have transformed the, the level of care that we're able to offer at this hospital. We're in the midst of an almost $8 million renovation project right now where we're going to build out a brand new, what will eventually be a 14-bed ICU, going to go from 2,100 square feet to 14,000 square feet. It will be, without question, the nicest, most well-equipped, the best intensive care unit in all of Central Texas. One of the most moving moving experiences I've ever had in my entire career of all the many things that I've done was uh, within about six months of the time that those doctors arrived, we had a, um, a woman fly in from a hospital near Tyler, Texas actually, which is a long ways away, a major medical center. The helicopter has to li land in the field by the post office. And so I talked with her later and she, so she told me um, that, that she had been given last rites at her hospital up in, uh, up in Tyler, and, and her husband said, is there anywhere, anyone who may be able to help us? And the doctor up there said, you know, at St. David's Georgetown Hospital, there's two doctors who are doing some very unique groundbreaking work in the airway. If anybody can help them, they're probably the only ones to do it. So they called down here, and our doctor said, yes, we'll, we'll take the patient. So she said she was conscious. She just had this blockage that they couldn't relieve in her airway. They flew her down. She landed in the, she landed in the field. She looked out one window, saw the parking lot, or saw the uh, post office. She looked out the other window. She saw the cows near the concrete plant across the way. Then she sees the ambulance bouncing across the field to come pick her up out of the helicopter helicopter and they put her back in the back of the helicopter and she was not feeling real confident. Remember, this was she was literally taking her last breaths as she was arriving and, uh, and so they put her in the ambulance, they brought her around and she said as soon as she came in and she started coming in contact with our doctors and our nurses, she felt at peace. She recognized this is where she was intended to be. And the doctors and nurses did a bedside vigil for about two days. They went in and used that freezing spray, that CSA on her, um, on her airway, removed the tumor over a little period of time and she literally went out, I'm going to choke up now, she literally went out of here on her own steam five days later, back to her children. And so that kind of thing is very rewarding and I know our staff takes great pride in being part of a clinical team that is led by fantastic doctors and using technology that we have access to as part of the St. David's healthcare system and in an environment where people are, are receiving that warm, friendly, personal care that, uh, that Frankly, I just don't know that they could get at every other hospital. So the, the foundation's mission, when I first came over, was really undefined. We generally knew we wanted to improve community, the community's health. We came to a pretty critical fork in the road really early on. There were folks within uh, the leadership that said, uh, maybe we should be about having clinics that supported indigent care. And at that time, Lone Star Circle of Care, which then was the Georgetown Community Clinic, was really still just in its infancy and getting, getting on its feet. So there was this, this period of evaluating, should we go into competition with the Georgetown Community Clinic and create our own sustainable indigent care clinic? Or was there another way to move forward? And I think ultimately in talking it through, the fact that that Georgetown Community Clinic was in the process of getting its federally qualified health center designation, which then meant a sustainable revenue source, we felt like we could do more to expand their mission as it relates to uninsured and underinsured individuals by investing in them versus competing with them. And I think that was a really critical first step in how, we, how we've arrived to where we are as, as Georgetown Health Foundation. What the Georgetown Health Foundation's first really significant investment in Georgetown Community Clinic was creating a 50,000 square foot multi-specialty clinic here at Lake Air Medical Center. And that was about a $6 million investment where we provide substantially reduced rental rates, which allows Lone Star Circle of Care to see approximately 20,000 unique patients each year. And so that's something that we're really proud of. It provides care in dental services, pediatric services, adult med medicine, behavioral health, pharmacy, vision, and senior care, 
all in one stop. So you can come to one place and everyone in your family can be seen irrespective of your ability to pay. And that was, I think that was a, a milestone investment for us. And it's one of the projects that I'm, I'm most proud of. That was my first project with, with the foundation. It's one that I, I still relish. In late May of 2012, a dynamic public health administrator with remarkable background experience in healthcare and law arrived in Georgetown. She would become CEO of Clinical Operations for Lone Star Circle of Care, leading it through a difficult time and preserving the important healthcare safety net for future generations. So healthcare reform is now happening and I'm at the University of Illinois Medical Center, which is an awesome place to be, a uh, fantastic uh, institution, but not it's not a speedboat. It's not going to cut. It's not going to create change quickly. It's going to basically try to shape change around it as it currently exists. And so I thought if there was somewhere I could go that would provide me with an opportunity to actually try to engage the best parts of healthcare reform as I understand them, um, then, then I should go there or I'm going to miss this moment in my chosen career, I was telling my close friends about it. One of my close friends had moved down here to work for Lone Star. So finally, she said, don't even interview for a job, just come down here and meet the people. So I come down and um, met, you know, uh, met all of the leadership and listened to sort of where they were at and what they were talking about. And what I realized is this organization is trying to do all of the things that I've thought about. and. So I went back to Chicago and I thought about it and I thought about it and I thought about it some more. And finally, somebody asked me, have you ever thought about living in Austin? And I said, not a day in my life. <laughs> I said, but that's where the opportunity is. So that's how I found myself here. I was brought in as the chief operating officer of clinical systems. When you look at patient-centered medical home, it's much more about uh, how are you gonna coordinate care for the patient? How are you going to include the patient in the decision-making process? What is the patient experience like? Um, so more of the healthcare reformish sides of what healthcare is becoming mm -hmm. um, and creating the apparatus to be able to do that in an organization um, across the organization, regardless of who the patient is. That's the, that's the amazing story. And I think that's really the credit to Rhonda. The, the crisis, the Lone Star Circle of Care Board on which I sit was notified in like April of 2014 and that in May of 2014 that we would not be able to make payroll. And that's a pretty startling when you're when gut wrenching. Gut wrenching, absolutely gut wrenching and completely unexpected. And so uh, from a span of May of 2014, which we were close to not making payroll to May of 2015 under under new leadership with with Rhonda and and John Calvin as the chief financial officer, they are uh, they've exceeded all of all seven of their HRSA metrics green within one year, and that meant going from essentially negative days cash on hand to right right at the, the one year mark they were over 65 days cash on hand, I believe. So that was pretty amazing turnaround, a turnaround that I had not not seen. I mean, that's, there were, I think around 36% of the workforce was reduced and yet the clinicians stayed, the doctors, the providers, the nurses, people stayed because they believed in the mission of, of Lone Star Circle of Care. Uh, in 2014, Lone Star really functioned like a corporation. Uh, and silos within the organization that did different things. So uh, for me, I knew there was a lot going on in the organization and I knew that there were different groups of people who are pursuing all of these various and sundry strategies. What I spent my time doing in early 2014, actually from 2012 to 2014, was getting clinical operations to the point where um, I thought that it needed to be in terms of uh, overall production and in terms of where we were in being responsive to quality metrics. Uh, that was sort of my role as a chief operating officer, and that's where I spent the vast majority of my time. So we were having an excellent year from that perspective uh, in terms of clicking off all of the various targets that we had set for ourselves. Um, and it looked like it was going to be a good year. Uh, in March, 
I started to understand that there was something that was going awry. Uh, and I had conversation with some knowledgeable people and they indicated that, you know, yes, there are outstanding receivables that we're waiting for that we may or may not get. So I realized at that point, although I didn't realize the extent to the size of the outstanding receivables, that there was a looming financial issue with some of the outlays that had been made on these other ventures. And so once we sort of crystallized our list into, these are the key activities we need to engage in. Um, and the key activities ended up being, you know, uh, we need to do these reductions in force because we have not too many employees. We need to consolidate our administrative spaces. There's no reason why we need to have two. Um, we need to reduce the size of, uh, we need to reduce the uh, size of, you know, the, the future uh, expansion footprint, which was huge. So we needed to get out of leases, work our way out of leases. Um, we needed to uh, exit our non-profitable out of scope operations. So we needed to do that. Um, and we needed to renegotiate our bank debt. Um, so those were really the big structural activities. And then we needed somebody who could um, give us the chance to, to implement the plan. Because at the stage where we took over, had Georgetown Health Foundation uh, not come to our assistance and provided that initial uh, funding, I know for a fact that we wouldn't be sitting here talking about an organization that's, that's still in the world and actively caring for tens of thousands of patients. I mean, there's just no doubt in my mind. So his board was incredibly, incredibly courageous. And honestly, given the set of facts that we had, I, I still don't know today how they made the decision other than that they are just excellent people who are willing to put their own names uh, potentially um, and likely on a, on a failed attempt to, to revive an organization. Um, because by all indications, if you looked at statistics, if you looked at financials, if you looked at whatever all else the case may be, an organization that does a 30, mil 30 million, close to $30 million restructuring in 30 days or less, they don't survive. Doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't make it. I've never seen, never, <laughs> never seen a case study where they don't, that they don't make comes it. out successfully. No. Um, so you know, and it and it took somebody being courageous and taking the outside chance on something that you know seemingly all light was gone. You know, I I spend a lot of time in this job looking at the experience that I've had and trying to relate it to what's going on now. And I remember a couple of very forward thinking doctors who started a nursing school because there was a need for nurses. So when you look at, again, there are just so many pieces of the things that have happened before us that I look at and say, these things are not out of the realm of possibilities because they happened before. They may not have happened in exactly that same way. I'm not sure that, you know, Doug and Hal and John and Dick and, you know, those folks would have said, gee, there's going to be a medical school here. But if you said, is there going to be medical education in Georgetown or Williamson County? They would say, sure, we did it. There was a nursing school here. Everything you do, you build on, you know. And, and I think it's that sort of bringing this thing full circle. It's that, it's those guys that were here and girls that were here before um, that had the forethought to be able to know that healthcare was a really, really important, important piece of the community and built these things. You know, it's all about standing on somebody's shoulders. It's all about just not being brilliant, but being smart enough to make that next step, whatever that thing is. And I, I, you know, I think this county and Georgetown have done a remarkable job of doing that. Moving forward, looking to see what the need is, figuring out how to fulfill that need and, and taking that next step toward that thing just constantly. And it's brought us a tremendous way. Georgetown Health Foundation envisions our community as a place for every person to feel empowered to build and sustain a healthy and productive life. Our work includes conducting and analyzing research to identify areas of need, 
studying trends to illuminate health gaps where a smart investment can make a big difference. The Foundation continues to invest in an array of services and nonprofit partners who provide for every generation, from new babies to grandparents and thousands of folks in between. We support health essentials that range from checkups and transportation to exercise classes and emotional support. The top funding recipients to date include Lone Star Circle of Care, The Caring Place, Boys and Girls Club of Georgetown, The Georgetown Project, and Ride On Center for Kids. Each of these partners provides services that strengthen the health of our community. Between 2007 and 2017, Georgetown Health Foundation expanded its community financial support from 155,000 benefiting 11 local nonprofit groups to over $17 million that benefits 120 local nonprofit organizations, a remarkable accomplishment. Our research led to the initiation of long-term public-private partnerships that target critical needs in Georgetown that include the city's first fixed route bus system launched in 2017 and the mental health in schools program started in 2016 to provide mental health counselors in Georgetown ISD schools. Through Georgetown Hospital's St. David's HCA partnership, a source of funding for the Georgetown Health Foundation ensures an opportunity to meet the unique health needs of our community far into the future. Through our short history as a philanthropic organization, we continue to honor our mission as a healthcare provider. The legacy of caring excellence begun in the 1950s by family doctors Hal Gaddy and Doug Benolt was expanded with community support to the last half of the 20th century and into the new millennium. The cutting edge medical facilities serving Georgetown today are a direct reflection of the culture they built and the community that supported and nurtured their vision. For 100 years, Georgetown has had a hospital here at home and a community of leaders and dedicated health professionals to ensure the health of future generations. If I had my life to live over, I would choose precisely the same things I've experienced in the past. It's been a wonderful profession. It's been my good fortune to uh, be associated with people that I loved and enjoyed, and that's what was good to me.